right now we're going to move forward to the man of the 50 minutes, uh, Simon De Sintra. Our own, our very own uh, Jack D, but funnier. And not only funnier, but more interesting to look at. Uh, so he's done corporate gigs, um, 10 years at American Express, where he was the head of um, corporate card sales. Um, he's also done acting gigs, obviously. Um, range of TV stuff, uh, including Holby City, an old favorite of mine. Um, and now I think he's in a, in a great place in, in terms of he's moved into consultancy, coaching and training as of 2006. And he's been doing a great job. He's, uh, he's founded Act, Act Naturally and it's gone international, which is amazing. Uh, amazing, let me talk properly, which is amazing. Um, so his forte is around building communication skills, impact skills, change management, conflict resolution, and of course, presentation skills, which he's gonna be talking about today, uh, which is gonna be, yeah, great to listen to. Uh, he's a regular MB on MBA programs um, at leading business schools, including London Business School, um, and Cass, and he's also um, put together in his spare time a um, a premiering um, a premiering play, uh, which is which is great as well. So he's a, he's a man of many um, many skill sets, and finally, he's also published a book, um, which we are going to be giving out to a lucky few. So we're going to be running a poll, um, a question poll. Uh, so pay attention. Uh, we're going to be asking a question um, at the end of the session, and three lucky, um, three lucky viewers are going to be in with a chance to actually get a copy of that book. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to push you over to, to Simon. Simon, if you would like to share your screen now. Yes, well, just while I'm doing that, Daniel, will you be my agent? Well, I'm trying. I'm I'm looking into like um a potential, not a full change of career, because I do like my my job here. So. Like maybe a part-time gig in, in, in being an agent. So I, I don't know. When I open up. Uh, so I click yes. So then it'll just, there we go. And that should let me. Got you. That's Fantastic. Good. All right. Enjoy, everyone. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to start just by thanking Amanda uh, <laughs> and Daniel for really stepping up to the plate during lockdown. Because uh, I think the support we've been given by you has been outstanding. Uh, and certainly I've been a, a frequent participant on these, these webinars. And so thinking about in terms of preparing for today, I, ha I had two goals. Uh, the first was to share some of the insights and inspirations I've had um, during, during lockdown, the people that have sparked thinking in me. Uh, I wanted to share those with you in the hope that they do the same for you and they prick your curiosity. Uh, because the reality is there's quite a lot I want to cover over the next 40 minutes and I, I want to lay it out as a buffet. Some things may resonate with you more than others um, and if, if they do and it encourages you to explore further into some of the things I talk about, that's great. Uh, the second one though is, is very much how I view this as a participant and my goal is to, to offer a handful of practical nuggets that you can take away and implement. Um, and that I think work because not only have I experienced that, but I've seen uh, with others. So those are my two goals um, over the next 40 or so minutes. Presentations without the drama. Well, of course, presentations need drama to engage the audience. That's, that's something that it's a necessary ingredient, but perhaps something that's less helpful um, is, and that can get in the way is the trauma that, that we can feel during the process. The trauma, the anxiety, or even plain and simple, the, the fear. And this can surprise us. Um, it can crop up for even the most experienced um, of presenters. And it's an area I'm particularly interested in because as an actor, a presenter, a workshop lead, leader, stage fright and nerves is something that I frequently suffer from. Naturally, I suppose I'm a bit unusual um, in this world because I would consider myself an introvert. So it's made me think about what are the practical ways I can, I can deal with this. So that's the flavor of today. And we'll look at this at what we can do before, during um, and after. So moving on. Um, 
let, let's sort of begin to label what this anxiety and fear, how it can sometimes manifest itself. So we have a quick poll for you, but I just wanted to add a, a little bit of context to these things. And I wonder if you've uh, ever felt like this. Um, the message feels very clear in my head. So everything sounds great in our own heads, but sometimes when we hear ourselves speak out loud, and we hear our own voice, the confidence can, can dip. Uh, this is the second slide, so hopefully, uh, I'm not sensing this, fortunately I can't see anybody, but sometimes we can misread what we see from the audience and we sense people wanting us to hurry up. Um, even though we know our, our, our subject matter really clearly, when we feel people disagree with us, suddenly how quickly that confidence can evaporate. Other people's status when we're asked to present to a group that we perceive as being more senior or more, more knowledgeable than us, sometimes that can get in a way and sometimes our own status can suffer as a result. You know, and finally, I wonder if you've ever felt that um, when the technology fails or you just have that out of body experience where you forget where you are, um, what appears to the audience as seconds can feel like hours. And I can see some people sort of responding to that. So, you know, those are the things that can get in the way. And by the look of it, in terms of the poll, um, there are some, you know, there's some synergy there. So actually, this is a very sort of very real um, situation. So, Daniel, if you can end the polling and I'll, I'll move on. Um, and I'll take that off my screen so I can see it. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd just offer some of the things in my experience that don't work. It's quite useful um, to know these. And these have sort of come... Um, these are sort of uh, I've had experience of. I remember one of my bosses at American Express offering me this, you know, Simon, in order to make the next step, you need some more gravitas. And actually, as a piece of advice, it was offered with good intentions. The problem I had is I just didn't know where to buy a bottle of gravitas. So whilst it was offered with useful intention, it was a bit too generic for me to actually find useful. Um, these days, um, multimedia opportunities are, are out there and we've, it's never been easier to see other people present, TED Talks being one of them. But isn't it tempting to imitate and copy um, the, the ones that we find very inspirational, engaging? Um, and the danger of that is that we end up losing sight of our own natural casting and who we actually are. So something that can start off useful can actually drive us insane trying to be as good as everyone else. Um, if in doubt, load up on the content. Um, you know, very often if we want to persuade people, sometimes we think the more content, the better. And that can be dangerous because actually when we sense that not happening, that can drop our confidence. Uh, misinterpreting what the audience wants, because very often we look at what the audience wants from our own perspective. Um, a personal anecdote on that, Daniel mentioned that uh, one of the gigs I do is working on the MBA programs at London Business School. And I have a very good colleague who's very blunt, and I hope everyone listening has one of those. They're the most useful friends and colleagues to have. Because I went into Mark's room at the end of a, a workshop I'd been running on personal impact. And I said, I, you know, I just don't think I gelled with them that um, they got me. And Mark made the point, he said, Simon, do you think the problem is that what you're trying to do is make friends and please people and actually that's different to what they're looking for and that really struck home that that really sometimes what we want isn't the same as what the audience actually needs and i'll touch on later that actually as human beings we're not necessarily as good as we might hope or think we are at interpreting body language and what's coming from the audience and the final point for me is key because there's a real risk that we don't practice out loud enough or even try out new things in a safe environment so that we can you know, not so much learn from mistakes but actually start molding things that don't work. So one of the phrases I have is that we should practice for progression rather than the burden of getting things right all the time. I do want to now just look at this idea of, um, if I can move the slides on, um, I want to go back to this idea of this, you know, the drama. And I did say that I'd share with you some of my heroes. Uh, and Viktor Frankl is certainly one of those because he was the first wisdom that I came across that offered the, the fact that it's very hard to do anything about this trigger that we feel. When we feel anxious or fearful, sometimes actually in a situation that we've been in before. And it's very easy to be defeated by the idea 
um, that we shouldn't feel like that. And I wonder how many of you listening have proverbially beaten yourself up a bit thinking, why am I feeling nervous? I've given this presentation a hundred times. Why suddenly am I hit by this? Well, of course, this fear and anxiety response is, very, is almost primeval. Um, the engine house for, for that is the amygdala, which comes in a very um, basic primeval part of the brain. So you can't actually change the trigger, but here's what Victor had to say on it. Between that stimulus and the trigger and our response, there is a space and there is a space for us to make choices and manage it. And it's in that space that we learn and we grow. So all I want to offer there is that next time you feel this, um, please don't beat yourself up for the fact that you feel anxious when you feel that you shouldn't do um, and don't surrender to it. Actually focus on how you manage it. And that's what I want to move on to now. Um, I call this um, the idea of bubble and struggle. So when I feel sort of anxious and I get that feeling, these are the two words um, that I think about and I wanted to share with you. Let me explain to you what I mean by the bubble. The problem bubble um, is the containment of that fear or anxiety. Because very often the problem for us is not that we feel anxious or fearful in the first place, it's just that we get into that fear bubble too early and we stay in it for too long. So what do I mean by that? If a presentation we have to give that's of high stakes, uh, let's say for all of us it's pitching for business, is in a month's time and it's a pitch that we really need to win. The temptation is to get into that fear bubble, that feeling anxious, actually when we know that we've got to present and if we're not careful, stay in it for too long. The concept of the, this idea of a fear bubble says that we can't avoid feeling anxious, but we have the choice and control where to put it. So when I'm in that situation, I put the fear bubble actually on the day that I present because there's nothing wrong in feeling it, but actually I don't want to feel like that while I'm trying to pre prepare. And when the fear and anxiousness comes knocking on my door, quite often it's that little voice that we hear, I remind myself that I've put that fear bubble in a very specific place. So it's not denying its existence, but it's putting it into context. I've actually even got into the stage now where I put it on my, my, my calendar uh, when I know I've got to do it. Um, the struggle is something that we all know already, that actually we get the most satisfaction and gratification out of things that we find a challenge. I mean, anecdotally, the simplest idea of that is, you know, after today, I'm presenting to um, 75 people I don't know, um, the glass of wine that I have in the garden is going to be the most satisfying one that I've had in a while, because out of that struggle and coming through it uh, comes our idea of sort of happiness um, and fulfillment. So there's something about bubble and struggle that we knew already, but I just remind myself of that. Uh, Ross Edgeley, that's on the slide that I just wanted to share with you, somebody I came across on a podcast during lockdown. Um, he's an adventurer and an athlete. Uh, amongst his many things that he's done, he's swum the entire circumference of the UK. I mean, literally, he's swum along the coastline. And resilience is a word that's bouncing around a lot. And I just wanted to share with you that. Uh, his definition that I really liked. He defined his resilience as the strategic management of suffering. And I thought that was a really uh, good one. Uh, if you're interested in uh, where I met Ross um, uh, online, it was on a podcast called The Kempcast, and I I'm very happy to share these. Uh, but I thought that was a very good uh, definition. Um, I did mention on the um, uh, for want of a better word, the advert for this session, that I, I really do love finding um, my sources from, from a range of places. I mentioned Ant Middleton to Aristotle. And I have to credit this idea of the fear bubble with um, Ant Middleton. I, I'm an ex-soldier. It was my first job, actually, when I left university. So I, I read both his books with, with, I guess, a connection anyway. Um, but I really liked this, this, this context of it. And he talks about it in his first book, First Man In, but also I noticed he, he's named his second book, The Fear Bubble. And even if the army and, and that isn't your thing, I think, still think the principle holds true. He mentions a couple of uh, rules. One, limit your stay. Instead of staying in the fear bubble too long, think about where you put it. And most importantly, you've got to enter and exit from different points. And you have to be really strict with yourself. So on the day of a presentation, something that you feel 
is very high stakes. It means that you have to come out the other side uh, when the presentation is over. If it's pitching for business, as an example, you can't stay in the fear bubble. You have to discipline yourself to, to put another fear, fear bubble um, out there, maybe the day that you, you, you find out the result of the pitch. So have multiple fear bubbles, not, not, just, uh, not just the one. I found that very therapeutic. I thought about including it today. Um, it's something that's very close to my heart because during lockdown, I've had a health scare. And I can say hand on heart that, that, that this works in a variety of contexts. So I just wanted to offer it as something new um, and uh, please give it a go. Uh, this was one of my favorite quotes. I'm just checking on the time. As an ex-soldier, I want to be on time for you. Um, but this was one of my favorite quotes from his books that I just thought I'd share. Because it's something I'm going to touch on later about casting. He tells us, don't let anyone else define who you are. Isn't it easy for that to happen? People always make rapid judgments about what sort of person you are from first impressions. Um, and that's their choice, not ours. It's easy to fall into that mold. Um, and I would add to that, people don't necessarily do that with a, um, a malicious intention. But actually, um, one of the things that helps with anxiety is our sense of control. And um, that's our choice. I did promise a bit of Aristotle. And Aristotle and Plato, they had a take on happiness, um, which they called eudaimonia. And eudaimonia, um, when, when I hear that as a phrase, reminds me of one of the first directors I had, who was from New York, from the Bronx, actually. And I, it, it sounds like um, him describing the grumpiest person in the room, eudaimonia. But actually what it means is that this whole ethos is let's not confuse um, what we mean by happiness, which is getting through something we view as a struggle with pleasure. Uh, there's nothing wrong with pleasure, but they're two different things. I thought this was a great quote from another one of my heroes, Mark Manson. Happiness comes from solving pr problems. Uh, problems never stop. They merely get exchanged or upgraded. So the secret source of solving problems is not them not existing in the first place. Um, and on that, I would overlay um, a definition of cre creativity I heard during lockdown which really, really helped that actually the basis of cre our creativity is the ability to problem solve and overcoming nerves and being able to share the way we, uh, in the way we want to is, is uh, a way of our creativity. Robert De Niro, um, I was 37 years old when I uh, went to drama school. Uh, some of my friends un unkindly uh, called it a midlife crisis. Um, my wife went with this and I've included this slide because the talent in the choices is one of his quotes, and it was on a card that my wife gave me um, as I, I went off to London Drama School, um, the age of 37, I think. So I wanted to include it. Um, the cheeky side of me wanted to put in this phrase, any slide deck will do, because if we're honest with ourselves, when we're pulling together the content for the next presentation uh, we give, and it's something I share with my corporate clients, it's so tempting, you know, to pick the last slide deck or presentation that, that roughly fitted the bill. So in other words, when we come to prepare, we focus a lot on content and what is the right content. And very often we can actually overload the content. So I wanted to give you today something a little bit different just to have a look at, um, because um, it's actually how we drive the content that really makes, makes the, the, the difference on this. So this is an opportunity for participation. Um, I have a very simple phrase here, um, as this is a speaking part, I better take a quick drink. So we have on there um, a sentence, which I'm not going to read out because I'm going to offer it in um, a few different ways in a moment. Um, but I'm not going to change the word or words or the order of the word. But as I show you the next slide, I'm just interested in what you what you pick up from the way I deliver it. Um, so if you feel so inclined, maybe just share in, in, in the uh, chat box uh, what you've got in terms of what you think my intention is. So the effect I'm trying to have on you with, with the very simple state, uh, statement there, um, that one. So here goes. I didn't say he sold a laptop. So I just wonder on there, what am I trying to, what's the effect I'm trying to have on to you with that? that? I didn't say he sold a laptop. Um, is there anything else coming into chat? I've got three.
not sure I can see. Deny, yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, it's a bit of clarify. So actually, I've got to be careful of uh, my drama training, maybe 20 grand, not well spent. Let's try another one. Um, I didn't say you stole the laptop. I didn't say you stole the laptop. Or how about, I didn't say he stole the laptop. I didn't say he stole the laptop. Or even, I didn't say he stole the laptop. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is this isn't uh, trying to be a showcase or, or audition any acting skills or, or lack of them. But actually, if you just if you go with it, there's a big difference between um, trying to deny and maybe to accuse or clar clarify. And it's very tempting to think that it comes solely from um, the emphasis we put on different words. But actually, if we trust the intention, which is the effect we're trying to have on the audience, it works a bit better. So um, thank you for going with that. I just want to build on this because very often we don't think about the effect that we want to have on the audience maybe enough. Um, and I just want to go with a metaphor on this in terms of what I mean by intentions and, and a few traps that we can fall, fall into. Um, for any vegetarians on this, and my, both my children are vegetarians, please go with the, this uh, analogy of, of, of a recipe, but you can just as, just as equally substitute tofu uh, for chicken. The writer in me thinks that chicken and rice just is a little bit more musical, so please forgive me for that. But let's me, let me explain what I mean uh, by this as analogy. So I, I, when I'm putting together my recipe of intentions for a presentation, um, I worry if I'm just chicken and rice. And let me explain. I want you to imagine dinner this evening. If dinner this evening is, as on the slide, is chicken and rice, or tofu and, and rice if you're a vegetarian, after you've eaten it, you will feel less hungry than you did before. That's obvious. And actually you will go, go to bed satisfied, but not necessarily uh, memorable. Now I want you to imagine that supper, the last meal of the day for the next month, is chicken and rice. At the end of that month, all things being equal, we're all still going to be living and breathing. Uh, but ask yourself how you're now feeling about chicken and rice. And in terms of how we build and deliver content, sometimes unwittingly, we can, as presenters, end up being a bit chicken and rice because we limit our recipe to the main ingredients. Now, of course, in corporate terms or in business, we're not talking about chicken and rice. It's just a useful way of remembering it. So let me bring this back into the real world. Um, the danger is if we don't think enough about the effect we're trying to have on the audience, we tend to default just to the main ingredients. So the main ingredients that we're talking about in terms of the effect we're trying to have on the audience are on the left hand side to inform, to clarify to educate, update, outline, or maybe to confirm. Let me be very clear on this. There's nothing wrong with these as main ingredients, but if that's all we're offering, you know, ask yourself what, what, what extras are we, are we doing? And they're the ways to engage the audience. So here's a few suggestions on it. Maybe to spice things up, we might want to challenge or disrupt, you know, traditional thinking, maybe even energize um, the audience, maybe to provoke or poke or inspire. But here's the danger with this analogy and why for me it works. If you sit through 15 minutes of someone challenging you, disrupting, energizing or provoking, what's the risk? Actually, the risk is it becomes too much, it becomes overpowering. So what does that tell us about the spices we think of? when we're building our recipe of intentions for our content. We need them, but use sparingly. And if I complete the analogy for you um, with the sugars, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be entertaining, to tell a few jokes, to amuse, you know, to praise, um, to reassure. Uh, the same problem applies. If that's all we're doing, sometimes there's a risk and we might have felt it. We've listened to some speakers and there's a lot of sizzle to it and we like it, but the content hasn't really stuck. And this is the key. I'm not in any way saying we don't need to focus on the content. The danger is if that's all we focus on and we don't think about the effect we want to have on the audience in terms of the intentions, we might unwittingly end up being a bit chicken and rice. Um, 
So think about that as something else um, when you're presenting. My experience is when we get nervous, when we think about uh, um, when we think about those five minutes before we go in, actually what we're trying to do is remember our content, isn't it? Aren't we? Sorry, that, that we try and think about trying to remember 40 minutes, and it can drive you insane and make you more nervous. More healthy thing is just to get in your head. What is my recipe? Go through it cycle through it what is the effect that i'm trying to have on the audience and if you are sure about that and take control um, the audience will go with you on that so that's just you know a concept i wanted to sort of offer uh, please forgive me just just want to check in on the time because there's a lot to cover um, now once we're inside the bubble so i want to take you to the day of the presentation you wake up and you're feeling nervous uh, the first thing to do there is to acknowledge it because you knew it was going to happen. We're in the fear bubble. We knew it was going to come. Um, but we have some strategies, um, you know, to deal with this. And uh, one of my one of my influences is Amy Cuddy. And she talks about power poses. Um, there is a TED talk on uh, called Power Poses from Amy Cuddy. It's nine minutes long. It's very well worth um, a watch. And you may may well many of you have seen it already. Um, what was interesting about this is that she talks, uh, she gets quite clinical about it and she talks about the effect of power posing for two minutes um, before you go and do something which you view as, as being uh, challenging. Uh, the example she uses is interviews, but presenting would work equally well. And she talks about the brain chemistry and neurology and the effect that it has. And she talks about the reduction of cortisol and the increase of testosterone. But it's a very simple concept and she talks about four power poses and um, the first one is the moment of victory which if i show you this um, they're all about making yourself bigger uh, and if i say very cheeky cheekily to daniel as a man united um supporter you, you'll probably have to do that from memory mate but um that doesn't preclude you um oh he's not responding so that's good i'm safe with the, <laughs> safe that's, with the that's not cool simon that's, that's not cool. Not, <laughs> Um, but what's interesting about that, the, the moment of victory, is that um, children who are born blind apparently do that instinctively. So it's not a learned behaviour, it's something that we do. Um, the, other th the other three you can see on stage, uh, the one with the hands on the hips, uh, that one um, is, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of uh, feeling confident, so it's, it's chest up. Uh, the one with the feet on the desks desk is what's the hassle but you notice the arms are behind so it's making it bigger and leaning on the desk is take me on if you dare one very important thing though uh, the suggestion is not that you do this in front of your audience i mean let's be very clear about that that would look very odd uh, and a bit weird um, but i promise you that two minutes um, and forgive me for getting a bit croydon here naffing off somewhere else instead of listening to other people who make yourself yourself nervous if you're in the fear bubble, take yourself off for a couple of minutes and give these a go. Uh, for the first three months of life as a professional actor, I, I, I clammed up at just about every audition I had because I would sit in a room with other people about to go in or audition. And what was my inner monologue saying? They'll get the job, you won't. So I was making myself small uh, and adding to the problem until a good friend of mine suggested doing this. Go outside, go somewhere else. It's in your control and practice this. The trouble with a lot of this is it just sounds too simple to work and that's why often we don't try it. But give yourself a chance, two minutes, somewhere else beforehand, uh, it's a great way of looking after yourself. Uh, I wanted to add to that because if we accept that nerves can trip us up and they're there, I wanted to offer you a few more things. Um, first of all, what I call my low drama, no excuse, five minute warm up routine. Um, again, I want to come clean with you. At drama school, after 15 years in the corporate world, um, for half an hour every morning at drama school, I found it a bit weird in my late 30s, um, lying on the floor, connecting with the floor, um, running around the room, um, pretending I could fly and trying to breathe out of my back. That's what actors do. But I'm not suggesting that. But actually what did come out of that is that five minutes before you do something um, that, that is challenging makes a big difference. Uh, my suggestion for this is this idea of tense and release. 
So tension, when we feel nervous, gets trapped in the body very often in places that we're not even aware of. So sometimes, you know, our, our voice can get trapped up there. I don't know if anyone else has felt like that. So we can sort of feel tension in here or, you know, with our jaw. I'm exaggerating a bit, but sometimes we don't open our mouths enough when we speak. So we get tense. So my suggestion is from the tips of your toes all the way up, um, clench and release three times and just shake it, shake it, shake it out. And something just for a bit of fun, I just thought I'd offer because we haven't got time to go through all that now. One of my favorite films um, is The King's Speech. And actually as my teenage, when I started doing this work, um, I asked my teenage son as he was then, if, how he describes what his dad does because I didn't have a normal job anymore. And he said, oh, dad, I just asked him if they've seen the King's speech. And I say, that's roughly what dad's, dad does, but for people in business. So this is an exercise from the King's speech, which I'd like you, as the cameras are off, to practice. So I'll embarrass myself, no one else. So clench it like that. And one, two, three. There you go. I have no idea if anyone's done that. That's a really good way of actually practicing that. Um, there is a there is a, a download on my website uh, which details some exercises on that. Really, the key thing is disciplining yourself to, to, to do that. Uh, practice with props. It is amazing that the most simple things on stage uh, become very difficult. I remember on stage the first time I had to pour someone a drink. It felt like brain surgery. There is something about being in the spotlight, the exaggeration, even. Um, on Zoom or virtually that makes working with props that much difficult. So my advice is use them, they can make an impact, but actually practicing because in your muscle memory, that will just mean that even when you get nervous, it'll happen anyway. The third point is um, a bit counterintuitive because there's lots out there that tells us that when we feel nervous or trapped to breathe in, um, I would just offer that that can feel really difficult because sometimes when you feel nervous, it can feel like being in a wind tunnel. So I want to op offer the opposite and maybe something else that we can do as, as we're on this. If in doubt, breathe it out. So when you feel nervous, actually the next thing you have to do is breathe in. So again, let me be clear. I'm not suggesting in the middle of presentation, you do exactly what I've just done there, which is make a deal of it. But when you feel yourself trapped or you have that out of body experience, instead of worrying about trying to do that, just breathe out. And actually your body will take over and it will not only breathe, but it will take a breath from your diaphragm. Um, and again, it's one of those simple things. I wasn't sure that would work, but one of my colleagues, who's one of the tutors at RADA, uh, I almost feel how I have to do that when I speak about rather the, the, um, uh, the arguably the best drama school in the country. So if it's good enough for David, it's good enough for me, but it works. So I thought I'd offer that. The final thing is, um, and I'm worried, I think I did this right at the beginning when I was trying to share my screen. When things go wrong um, with the technology or a prop or something, we have a slight habit of, of offering a commentary on what we're doing. So uh, it's frozen. So let me just fix this. Oh, that didn't work or whatever. Actually, that's not what the audience needs. What the audience needs and wants is for you to be in control. So I would suggest something a bit different. Just say, actually, let's take a time out and uh, give me a two minutes, talk amongst yourself, and we'll either have plan B or I would have fixed it by then. I just thought I'd offer that. Those are a few things that, that really seem to help. Um, how are we doing for time? 31 minutes. Um, I do want to talk about this idea about status because it was one of the things uh, in the poll that we can very often confuse the difference between uh, social and situational status. Social status is more fixed, isn't it? It's people's um, tenure, their hierarchy. But, but the world of work, I'm sure you'll agree, is changing. And actually what's much more relevant is our status or our experience in any given situation. The trouble is when we feel nervous, we can give away our status. Um, and this is a little bit of a clue of what Amy Cuddy told us. Uh, if we're not careful, we can actually find ourselves protecting ourselves by making ourselves smaller. So instead of doing that, my advice is, if you find yourself doing that during a presentation, don't beat yourself up about it, but just actually think about getting in the most comfortable position where you can be just a little bit bigger. Because something as simple as that, just changing what you're doing, can actually change what's going on up there. 
Uh, voice is my thing. Uh, I don't take it personally, but I'm told by, well, I know for a fact my voice um, gets more work than my face. So um, my, as my agent says, I have a, a, a good face for radio. Um, so voice does interest me. We can self-sabotage with our voice because if I go, hello, my name's Simon. I really want you to like me. It's not just Australians that do this. Please like me. Please buy into what I'm saying. And my voice gets stuck here. You know, an upward inflection in what I'm saying actually turns a perfectly good statement into a question. And it's one of the traps that normally when we're talking to our friends, we wouldn't go anywhere near. But if we're conscious of it, it's where we can go. So when you recognize that, just take a breath out, reset and reset your voice because awareness is a, is a big thing. Well, the other thing is actually when we send to people that we want to hurry up, we actually lower our status because we start talking much quicker. And it's a bit ridiculous because I don't run out of breath when I'm talking to my friends, but that's something I do. Again, when you find yourself falling into that track, just take a breath. Um, and my tip for that is particularly at the beginning of a presentation, start off with short sentences. And I would say, uh, as sometimes is described of me, uh, if in doubt, short, simple, shut up, particularly at the beginning of something that really seems to help. Ask yourself, what unhelpful beliefs do you have in terms about the situation or the audience that you're presenting to? Um, replace it with something true, the reality. And the reality often is, um, the vast majority of people are not there to judge us or trip us up because of course what they want from us is for us to uh, share our experience and learn and benefit from it but you've got to make a choice about your status and that doesn't mean sort of coming across as the the biggest person in a room but actually the off, often the problem is that we dial down our status unintentionally so i would just say to yourself you can even give it a scale um, today it's a pretty normal day. I feel like a seven out of 10. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to hold. Even if I walk into a room full of tens, I'm going to stay there. I'm just going to be conscious of what I'm doing with my body and voice because our status is something that we've got uh, more control of uh, than we think. I'm just going to just check in on the time uh, on this. Yeah, I've got five minutes left. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, talking to strangers is another one of my heroes. I really rejoice in people who have uh, a, a, a different viewpoint to mine. And it's very um, cathartic almost to hear Malcolm Gladwell's uh, version of body language, because he says we're we, in his new book, particularly talking to strangers, we're just not as good at interpreting body language as we think. And he makes the comment that, that for him, you know, he learned how to interpret body language from American TV shows like Friends, where actors are deliberately transmitting particular emotions and real people don't do that so be careful of that be careful of misinterpreting the audience that moment when we look in and we think i've lost them they're bored that probably that's not the case um, different people even look different uh, when they're listening so that's a you know moment of caution and a moment of sanity if you like i just thought i'd offer this um, insights myers briggs uh luna spark is the new one there are, there are many. When I was writing the book, I think I came across at least 30. Uh, but they all seem to converge and say, you know, something similar. I'm, I'm a particular fan of Bolton and Bolton, um, people styles at work. Um, and in our environment, I, I would imagine that we've all sort of come across this. So I wanted to offer something practical in the view of you talking to a large audience, um, almost an order. The yellow side of it are the people to start off with, really. Uh, sometimes referred to as sunshine yellow or the expressive. So get the big idea out there early. In this case for today, it might be, you know, the big idea is wouldn't it be great if we could manage our fear and anxiety for presenting better so that it doesn't go away, uh, but we feel that we're able to manage it better, have some strategies and share what we want to share. Uh, if we go clockwise, the next people you've got to pick up when you present to large groups are the drivers, the asserters, the what's in it for them. And that's why I said early on, and what I hope you'll get out of this is a handful of nuggets that you can actually apply that will make this easier. Then it's the devils in the details. The analytical people want a little bit more detail about that, about the um, sources and some practical tips. But they're, they tend to be a bit more patient, so they'll wait until you've gone through the other two. And then finally, uh, you can't ignore, but the people who um, want you to create a relationship with them and to make it um, relatable um, tend to be the most patient of all. 
I mean, this isn't cast in stone, but if you're looking for an order, this isn't a bad way of doing it. So I just thought that was useful just to slot in there because it's something that you can do if you don't know the audience as well as you want to. And I, I certainly sort of find that useful. So um, I'm very nearly at the end of my time. And I did promise I just wanted to share a few nuggets. Um, Mihai Csikszent Mihai. Uh, uh, I've got Wikipedia to thank for that. But this uh, Mihai was... Um, came across this idea about flow and actually sometimes how we lose ourselves when we're very much in the, in the flow of something. But I, I really liked his um, definition of enjoyment because as I've put on the slide, you know, and by the way, you might even enjoy it. Because let's not forget that enjoyment as the antidote to anxiety appears at this very bound boundary between boredom and anxiety. So we need anxiety anyway. And it's when the challenges that we have are balanced with our capacity to act. And I found that sort of uh, pretty reassuring. Um, in terms of finding your voice, so just to summarize the last 37 odd minutes, um, and it spells voice, which is for someone who's into voice is um, quite convenient. The V is for vocation. More and more now, people need to be able to share their ideas. They don't need to be perfect, but they need to have clear intentions and be passionate about it. And actually, that's what people want. It's not just us, you know, environment we're in, but more and more it's part um, of the jobs that we do. Um, uh, the O is for observation, not copying. So as a result of this, I hope what you get is, you know, the idea that we can be interested in this. So look how other people do it without the burden of copying. Uh, let's be really clear on what our attentions are, because we tend to have an impact when we're very clear on that, even when people don't agree with it, even when people don't agree with it. The casting is very important. Um, for me, the news was, um, uh, uh, despite being a soldier, I, I was told quite early on in my career that I don't look like a soldier. I've got a good friend with the same agent that got all those parts. Uh, but I do get hired a lot to play a doctor. That's my natural casting. I can't do anything about that. Um, but what I can take control of is how I want to come across. I mean, for me, I want to come across as someone keen to share rather to lecture. And so I, you know, I hope I haven't come across as too lechery in this because, you know, frankly, a lot of this is up for grabs. So the things that you can't control in your casting, but there are things that you can. Um, and it's important to know the difference. I heard during lockdown that we have about 15% wriggle room in terms of the things that we can't change. And finally, um, I read chemistry at university, um, which, uh, you know, again, sort of, is, I suppose, is a bit unusual for where I bended up. So it was great to be able to sneak in this idea of experimentation. But, you know, of course, scientists experiment quite often just to learn what doesn't work and to get things wrong. So, of course, I'm not advocating that we do that in the most high, high stakes, pressurized presentation. Um, but there's something that gets in the way that if we expect things to go right all the time, and I would just invite you to rejoice in the fact that we will learn just as much from things that don't quite work as the things that don't. Um, I worry about being an air freshener train or a webinar host in that I'm sure it's the same for all of us. You know, you hope to give people a nice time during this, but more important, you want people to remember and be able to implement. So I just thought I'd share with you what gets in the way. And it's the last 12 lines of the book. And it's what I remind myself every time I go into a situation. And it's how I want to finish. So let's remember when we hear that voice inviting us into the fear bubble too early, uh, that actually it's not the critic, and sometimes it's our own inner critic. It's not the critic who counts, nor the person who points out where the strong person stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. Because the credit is always going to belong to people like us who are actually in the arena, whose faces are often marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strive valiantly, who do know the great enthusiasm, and who at best know the triumph of high achievement, but who at the worst, if they fail, at least we fail while daring greatly, so that our place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Uh, that's how I'd like to end. Uh, I did mention we've got some hassle-free downloads uh, on my website, which we'll share in the follow-up. What I mean by hassle-free is you don't have to sign up to a newsletter or give me your email address. I won't even know you've been there, but they're simple sort of one-page downloads of the things that we've covered, like um, recipe of intention, the voice methodology, and actually a, a no-excuse five-minute low-drama uh, warm-up. Um, and I've got some videos on the YouTube. So we'll include all of that. Um, I did write a book, 
Uh, it's my book of the film. Um, and I just as a thank you back to the CPD, I want to offer some copies for that, um, uh, from, from that, uh, before they get pulped. Uh, for those of you that like uh, Alan Partridge, you'll know <laughs> the context of that joke. No, I'm joking, it's, it's, it's printed to order, so there's no risk of that. Um, and at risk of uh, coming across as uh, too highbrow, although I'm told that's a low risk, I wanted to sort of just finish with this. Um, and I did promise a variety of uh, uh, sources. So this is my, one of my favorites. Let's live in the now. The past is history, the future is a mystery, and the present is a gift. So there's no time like the present to um, put into practice some of the things we've talked about. And thank you, Kung Fu Panda. That's me, that's me, Daniel. That is a great movie, and that was a brilliant presentation. Power pose, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm gonna be definitely um, using some of those tips uh, as I continue doing these weekly webinars. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, just turning over to our questions now. Um, actually, no, before we do that, let's just run this poll quickly. Uh, we have a poll regarding, so yeah, please do get in the questions while we're about to run this poll. Uh, we have a poll for the book prize entry. Uh, so like we said at the beginning, three people are gonna win a book. So we just need you to answer this question. Uh, so go ahead and answer this question if you are interested in receiving one of those books. Uh, so if you want to read out the question, Simon. Yeah, so uh, one of my heroes is uh, oh, Professor Morabian. <laughs> Nearly gave away the answer. Because um, he's very often misquoted, so I thought I'd finish off with this. So the question is, what's his first name? Is it Martin, Andrew, Albert, Amin, or Farhad? And I'm not even reading that very well, but there you go. So if you're interested, have a, have a poll and we'll see. Uh, we're going to pick someone at random. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for putting that together. No worries, no worries. Uh, we'll just let that run because um, I know a couple of you are going to uh, take some time to think about that. So I'll let it run for a little while. While that's running, um, we have a few questions uh, that have come in during the webinar. Uh, please do continue to get those in. Uh, so one of the questions was from Judy, um, and I could definitely empathize with Judy on this one. Sometimes my heart races so much that I literally run out of breath and can't speak. Uh, yeah. Is there anything, any kind of tactic strategies? I know you touched on a few, but which one would you recommend uh, for this uh, scenario? Um, so, in, Daniel, was that for, who was that from? That was Judy. That's from Judy. So she says, uh, my heart races so much that I literally run out of breath and can't speak. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I felt that. So um, for a few snippets. First of all, unfortunately, what PowerPoint does to us is it makes us think in terms of bullet points and lists. So that's not naturally how we how we talk, because we don't do that when we're talking to our friends uh, socially, um, Judy. So what I would suggest is look through particularly the opening part of your presentation and work out where the full stops are. And this was my slightly flippant comment about short, simple, shut up. Because very often if we get off to a very good start about what are the short sentences, then our voice will go to the end, we'll know where the full stop is, and then we'll take a breath. Because the problem is we tend to run thoughts together. Um, this was Shakespeare. This is why we love Shakespeare 400 years later, because he wrote the way we speak in blood and breath, iambic pentameter. Um, so take the breath. And his point was uh, one thought per breath. And that's what gets us into trouble because we run too many thoughts when we write content into one breath. Reclaim the full stops. Yeah, thank you. Um, another one came from Rosie. And this one is in relation to status, uh, which I think is, is definitely an interesting one when it comes to presentation. So something I heard recently was that we are facilitators. It's okay if we don't know everything, we are facilitating a session. And if an attendee knows something we don't, then we can invite them to share their knowledge. And that is okay to do as a trainer or facilitator. So I guess it's more of a statement, uh, but what are your ideas around that? You so much on the money. I was, I was, um, I, I was over the moon when I first got the gig about 10 years ago to run a workshop on influencing and persuading. Um, at London Business School 
and it was with a group of eight and I was about to launch into my, my view on um, uh, oh, is that? Is that Robert, how funny, I forgot his name, Robert Cialdini. There you go, that'll serve me right. But I was about to launch into him and one of the students said, I worked for him for three years. And um, there was somebody observing me and I could see them be almost beginning to laugh. And I thought, actually, the best thing to do is to shut up and invite that person to say, well, what do you know about them? I think you're so right. All I, what I would share is the only one of the, um, and Daniel and I have talked about this because Daniel's a lot younger than me. One of the only benefits of getting older, although there are others, actually, I shouldn't say that, is that you learn that you don't know much at all. So the more you learn, the more experience you get, actually it lowers this burden and you can get curious. I do think that curiosity um, is a great antidote for conflict, by the way. So when someone challenges you, be curious about it. So, OK, that's an opposite point of view. T tell me about it. And it's a great deflector of it. A great, great spot, Katie. Thank you. Um, if I could perfect. just, um, sorry to jump in, but if I could just add to this point, because I think you make some, you know, that's a really good question. And Simon, you know, your advice there is spot on. I know that prior to founding the CPD Standards Office, I uh, sometimes worked academically and I lectured regularly at Warwick and Kingston Business Schools. And sometimes um, my audience was 30 first year students and sometimes it was 50 masters and sometimes PhD students and as you said Simon you know so many more people in the room knew more than I did and sometimes it was quite nerve-wracking to stand there and just deliver the content knowing that there were absolute experts in the room some of them very much my senior um, but changing it around and, as you say, you know, asking people to kind of contribute their point of view and almost being, um, I found, just honest and saying, well, this isn't my particular area of expertise, but if you're able to share more about that uh, to the group, then that would be fantastic. And then just letting that person have the stage for a minute or two, obviously not too long, there's always sometimes one that talks in the class too much, but, you know, encouraging collaborative discussion rather than trying to be um, the smarty pants know-it-all at the front of the room where people are clearly thinking, actually, I know more about that. So that, that was certainly my experience. Um, and another um, example was when I um, delivered some training at engineering companies um, and that was very much kind of business skills based and you know many of the engineers in the room had technical expertise that was way beyond a PhD level you know they were so specialized in what they were doing and um, I had, I, you know I found it really helpful after I'd sort of done this quite a few times to just explain at the beginning you know my my background is in occupational and business psychology this is my area of expertise and this is the angle that i'm going to talk about today and i put my hands up i am not an engineering expert so if i'm starting to talk about something that is leaning towards your technical expertise and doesn't make sense please can you let me know and please can you contribute to the group um, so that you can help me put it in context because i don't have a completely detailed understanding and nor will I ever of you know your particular engineering solution so I don't know if that helps but that's certainly been my my experience and and just being quite humble really uh, with your students and you know welcoming their contributions yeah definitely definitely honesty is definitely a great way forward in those cases um, got another question here uh, from Sean uh, Starts off with a thank you so much, uh, Simon. A lot of thank yous, I'll, I'll run them off in a second. Uh, how do you overcome um, a possible approach that can be perceived as aggressive when dealing with the status issue? Um, so when trying to present to people of a higher status, I think they're trying to say, how do you, come, how do you not come across as aggressive? That's a great point. Um, and who's that from, Daniel? That was from- That's from Sean. Sean, yeah, great point. So Sean? Um, my advice for that is match the energy, not the emotion. 
So the emotion for that might be your perception of aggressiveness, um, which, which very often we misread because um, people at sea level very often don't even know that they're coming across as a bit blunt or abrupt. It's just how they are because they haven't got time to be anything else. So you can match the intensity. So what I mean by that is match the speed. So be equally assertive in terms of how you get you go back, um, but not but actually not the um, anger or aggressiveness. So one of the things that the status gap, because I talk about mind the gap of miscommunication. So the status gap is a potential gap. But what we do is we can over offer an over elaborate answer. I, f I mean, I'm in danger of doing this now. So an over long answer, be as succinct as they are um, and match the tone, not the emotion. And also remember you're in control of your breath because one of the things that senior people are absolutely fantastic at is silence. So there is nothing wrong with you taking a breath or a moment before you respond. I'd yeah. really agree with that too, yeah. Simon. Um, somebody once introduced me to the concept of silent management, um, whereby you just use silence to either, you know, not only take a breath, but just to illustrate your point. And sometimes if you're, you know, really, really want to make your own point, just stay silent. And if you stay silent for more than five seconds, um, it can have quite a large impact on what you're saying or uh, before you respond. And that makes, you know, somebody realise that you are thinking it through. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple more questions to answer. Um, just before we do that, I'm going to share the poll results. I'm going to end that now. Uh, the right answer was indeed Simon. Uncle Albert. Uncle Albert. So 35 people uh, got the answer right, but only three of you are going to be um, get, receiving that book. So we're going to do a little draw and we'll, we'll send it out to obviously the people that were. Um, there, there is a sample of the book um, that you can try before you buy on, on the website, which you can download for free. And again, you don't have to sign up with any emails to get. Fantastic. We'll share that link uh, in the post email blast that we send out. Okay. Um, so we've got a thank you from Helen. Uh, we've got a thank you from Denise. Great session. Uh, so thank you so much, Simon. Uh, we've got another thank you from Judy. John saying thank you so much. Uh, Gary as well saying thanks for the interesting session. And then we've got another question here. So yeah. question is, my eyes have just gone blurry for a second. Um, where's that question gone? Right, so when I started face-to-face -face, uh, facilitation, this is quite a long one, sorry, Simon. Um, yeah. When I started face-to-face -face facilitation, I had to overcome the tummy butterflies. Then I got over them. Now I am a great face-to-face -face trainer. Then during the lockdown, I had to migrate, as everyone, uh, as everyone did, to virtual training. However, I realized with virtual, I am discovering a whole new set of fears that makes me doubt my abilities to facilitate altogether. Can you recommend good activities, behaviors when facilitating a virtual class to do when you break out in sweats and, and other irregular bodily movements? I'm not sure what they are, but if you can help us, I think it will go a long way. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I broke it. You probably know too many things at the moment. Where me that question is from. Yes, yeah. Um, so I've broken out in sweats. Um, uh, actually, I, it, it comes with the, with, you know, with the, the territory, but uh, let me offer something a bit more useful. So one of the things that, of course, with virtual is that you can't see everyone. So while I was doing my preparation for this, I was mindful that I was talking to somebody. So I had in my mind that actually I, I was talking to somebody specific because that's a way of, of making it sound more conversational. There is a risk with the virtual platforms that it that unintentionally can sound like we're giving a lecture. The other thing is just try different ways of interacting. So we had 40 minutes, we had a poll, I was sort of looking at the chat, asking rhetorical questions because it, there are probably a handful of things that we can do even on online that limit the distance between us and the audience. So I would suggest just have a think about beforehand anything that you can do to close this gap between you and uh, you and them. Brilliant. 
And then um, we've just got that last last question now, I think, for time's sake, uh, from Susan Dunn. How do you manage the person who is difficult and always wants to interrupt or challenge? Yeah. Yeah. So first There's of all, always one. There's always there's one, one in the room. <laughs> great question. Um, right. So first of all, can I just offer from uh, my own experience, don't try and win them over. The fools, that, that's a fool's errand that I've tried on, on a couple of occasions that I, I no longer do. Um, because there, there is, of course, the risk that you ignore everyone else. It's almost like the same principle of this fear bubble. You, you know, they're going to be there, but you have to contain it. So very often, um, the, the trick to that is to say, you know, just to call it, to say, obviously, for, you know, for the sake of everyone, I just want everyone, I'm mindful to give everyone you know, a chance. Let, let's have two minutes of your point, and then we'll get some views from other people and move on. So it's not ignoring it. You don't even have to be aggressive or counter challenge, but it's like put a bubble around it. We, we've got time for two minutes of it, then we'll move on and then we'll hear from some other people. Um, uh, two words though on that I just wanted to share is this idea about being appropriate and authentic. Because that's as good as it gets, that we are an appropriate for the audience and then we're an authentic version of ourselves. So, so actually the way we handle that, if we're appropriate with it and authentic to ourselves, we've got a fighting chance. Uh, ignoring it doesn't work either, but I'm sure you knew that before you asked the question. <laughs> and just, sorry. Can I just add, sorry, can I just add one final comment that just, I'm the one that's interrupting this time, um, about the previous question. I think for anybody who's been a face-to-face -face trainer to go on to online training, has been um, a really big step and we've all had to do a lot of CPD ourselves. Um, I know that Daniel and I have mentioned before, these sessions to begin with have been an absolute baptism of fire. I mean, we had held um, a couple of webinar sessions a year for our members, but nothing weekly and, and certainly nothing with the global audience. So um, we have got lots of help and support on our YouTube channel if you are looking to hone your yeah. online delivery skills. But also, you know, I think all of the points that Simon's made today, you know, do apply um, with um, online delivery as much as they do face to face. Um, the only thing that you're missing are the social cues. You know, right now I'm just staring at the dot on my computer talking to you all, knowing that there's lots and lots of people listening and that can see me. Um, and, I, and I don't have any feedback. I don't know whether I'm boring you or whether, um, you know, you're, you're not um, engaged or, or on the other end, whether you're hanging on to every word. So I, I you know, I, go back to face-to-face -face training um, with your head held high that's the first thing I would say but secondly you know don't forget the skills that you've learned for online training and you know apply this this knowledge that you've learned in today's session to both skill sets would you agree Simon yeah yes fantastic and then, so I have to ask the uh, ask this last question um, there's always one that pops up at the end um, but it's really relevant so Simon, how would you use props for your presentations? I don't think I'll be a better person to ask. How would you use props, props, like acting props in your presentations? So first of all, master them. So this was my very point about practicing with them. And I, I wasn't joking. I, I can remember thinking I'd rehearsed enough. I just had to pour someone a glass of wine on stage and I couldn't, I couldn't pick the bottle up. I mean, it was ridiculous. Fortunately, it was during the dress rehearsal. So it's not, it's something that is, is worth putting the extra sort of time into because the more you practice with it, the more it becomes part of you, not governing you be very clear about why you're using it. So all the stuff we talked about intention, um, it's very tempting to be a bit gimmicky about props. I mean, I certainly remember about five years ago, all the presentation, my mates were saying, I'll oh, start off with a, a prop or getting something out of a bag or something. Well, that's fine, providing it's relevant to the presentation. So I just offer this, Daniel, to, to Pradi. Um, convince yourself first that the prop is necessary, it has a relevance, and you know how to use it. Because the hardest person ever to convince is ourselves often. And if you do that, you've got a fighting chance of it coming across the right way to the audience. And, and Simon, just a question for me. How, um, 
how would you use props in an online session? Would you use props or would you sort of not, not use that for virtual sessions? Amongst my sort of teammates and colleagues, there are various things you can do, can't you? Because you, we've seen it on TV, you can pass things, you know, and if I pass that over, Daniel picks something up and, you know, <laughs> it's the same colour and we didn't even rehearse it. Um, I, one of the things I was conscious of, because I know at the beginning, Amanda, in all sincerity, there was a lot out there about framing on virtual and how to do that and look at the screen. Mm -hmm. When you were saying looking at, looking at the dot, I was conscious that because I wanted to make sure I was on the right place, that maybe I wasn't doing enough of that. I, I don't want to dodge the bullet on this because here's what I want to say from the years I've been doing this. If the audience believe you, okay, they will forgive quite a lot of technical things that could have been better. So if they believe your intention and they believe that you have an honourable intention of sharing and you believe what you're saying, um, they'll go with you. We tend to use props if we're not careful as literally that props as I'm not interesting enough, but if I have something, it'll judge it up. And I've had one of the comments, you know, thanks for your honesty. I, that was my, I was determined to be honest in the 40 minutes you gave me. And I do wonder sometimes if we literally rely on things where the simplest authentic version of ourselves would be enough all right so i'm not disagreeing with the idea of using props i just ask yourself the question would would not having it be equally as powerful yeah yeah that's why we love stories that i mean stories are fantastic you know yes yeah well thank you so much uh, for dealing with those questions uh simon for us and thank you everyone for attending um do you have any last last words for us Simon? Um, I would just say, don't let the inner critic win. Um, and I just repeat, practice for progression. Um, so I very much hope you picked up some tips. And if you have, take the next opportunity to put them in, pra in practice and be interested in how it turns out rather than having to get it right. Brilliant. And, and Amanda? Just a warm welcome, uh, sorry, a warm thank you to Simon and also to everybody for your contributions today. Um, it's been a really good session. Uh, and just a, a reminder to everybody that Get Face to Face Ready guidelines are available this afternoon. And there is also a member only webinar next week where you can join the conversation uh, with government. We have an MP chairing um a virtual session uh, with various parliamentarians to talk about getting face-to-face -face ready and getting training providers back in business and more details will be sent on that shortly um, but thanks again and now everybody go and have a cup of tea and, and enjoy the sunshine for a, for a moment or two yeah exactly all right and everyone uh thank you thank you jill paul hilda margaret andrew for all of the support so many nice comments megan paul Verna, Hillary, Kizzy, Lisa, all say an amazing session. Uh, so thank you guys for your support. Thank you, Simon, for the presentation. And we will be back again next week uh, with another CPDSO weekly webinar. So see you then.